Many types of equipment have a rotating shaft that penetrates a stationary housing. In cases where the equipment moves a fluid, some material or device is needed to seal around the shaft to keep fluids from leaking out and contaminants from getting in. Sometimes packing material is used to seal around the shaft. But most equipment that uses packing requires a small amount of leak off to reduce friction between the packing and the shaft. So in applications where leakage needs to be prevented, mechanical seals are often used. As a mechanic, you'll need to understand how mechanical seals work and how they're installed. Mechanical seals are often used in applications where leakage around a shaft needs to be prevented. For example, they're often used on pumps that handle hazardous fluids. Mechanical seals can be divided into two basic categories, pusher type and non-pusher type. These categories are based on the ways in which the seals allow the rotating ring and the seal between the ring and the shaft to move along the shaft so that proper clearances are maintained. Although mechanical seals are designed to last a long time, some of them fail well before their life expectancy is reached. One of the most common causes of seal failure involves problems with the equipment that the seal is installed on. For example, misaligned shafts, bent shafts, or bad bearings could easily cause a mechanical seal to fail. Sometimes, however, mechanical seals fail for other reasons. Another way that the seal face gap can widen is if either seal face becomes distorted or warped. One cause of seal face distortion is over-tightening the gland bolts during installation. Another cause of seal failures is overheating. Heat is often a part of a machine's operation, and mechanical seals are designed to function under those conditions. But sometimes the heat becomes so severe that the seal parts begin to break down. The seal faces may also be attacked by the fluid that's being sealed. One way to tell if this has happened is by examining the seal faces for damage. The materials used to make the seal faces are generally corrosion resistant so corroded or pitted seal faces could indicate a chemical incompatibility problem. Another cause of seal failures involves the improper installation of the seal. One of the most frequent installation problems has to do with the positioning of the rotating element. If the rotating element isn't positioned properly, the seal will almost certainly fail prematurely. The mishandling of seal components before and during installation can also lead to seal failure. The seal faces are among the easiest components to damage by mishandling because they're usually quite brittle. However, some mechanical seal components can be damaged because they're relatively soft. For example, during installations, O-rings or bellows are sometimes cut by sharp edges on the shaft, such as shaft shoulders or shaft keyways. The causes of mechanical seal problems that we've just covered should give you an understanding of why seals fail. When a defective seal is replaced, it's often possible to examine the seal's parts to find clues for the source of a problem. For instance, it may be possible to identify causes of some seal problems by examining the wear patterns on seal faces. Before a mechanical seal can be installed, certain preparations have to be made. These preparations typically include disassembling equipment and removing the damaged mechanical seal. Since one of the most common uses for mechanical seals is in process pumps, we'll use that equipment as an example. Our demonstration takes place in a seal manufacturer's training facility, but you'll probably install mechanical seals in a shop or where the equipment normally operates, so you'll need to follow some general precautions to ensure that the seal can be installed properly. For example, the work area and the pump housing should be cleaned. Also, company policies and procedures, as well as the appropriate safety precautions, should be followed. One of the first steps is separating the casing from the pump frame. To do this, the casing bolts must be removed. Then jacking bolts are installed to force the casing and pump frame apart. The jacking bolts are turned in a crosswise pattern to evenly dislodge the casing from the frame. Now the frame and the bearing housing can be moved to the side to allow for easy access to the remaining parts. 
the jacking bolts are also removed. Then the old casing gasket is taken out and discarded. A new gasket will be installed later. Next, the impeller is removed. And so is a small impeller gasket. The back plate is match marked with the frame to make reassembly and alignment of the components easier later on. Then the back plate can be removed. First, the nuts that hold the back plate to the frame are taken off. Next, the nuts on the gland studs are removed. And the gland plate is slid back out of the way. The back plate is then removed and set aside. This exposes the shaft sleeve and the rotating element of the mechanical seal. Next, the shaft sleeve and the rotating element are slid off of the shaft, along with the gland plate. Then, the mating ring is removed from the gland plate by simply pushing it out. After the collar set screws for the rotating element are loosened, the element is slid off of the sleeve. After a pump has been disassembled and its damaged mechanical seal has been removed, certain checks and measurements must be made before a new seal is installed. One of the first things to do is to check all machined surfaces for nicks and burrs. Minor imperfections can usually be removed with a light abrasive. Defects on the machined surfaces of the frame, the gland plate, the stuffing box housing, the shaft, or the sleeve could result in leaks and damaged components. But some pumps rely on metal-to-metal -metal contact, instead of a gasket or an O-ring, to seal between the shaft shoulder and the sleeve. On these pumps, the surfaces should be lapped to remove imperfections that could interfere with creating an acceptable seal. To do this, the shaft key is removed and then lapping compound is applied to the shaft shoulder. Next, the sleeve is placed on the shaft and turned. After several minutes, the sleeve is taken off and the lapping compound is cleaned away. The surfaces are then inspected to make sure that proper surface contact can be made. There are other important checks that should be made before a mechanical seal is installed. Some of these checks involve the use of dial indicators. One important check is testing for shaft runout. A shaft that's bent or out of round can damage pump components and prevent a mechanical seal from operating properly. Before the measurement is taken, the dial indicator is zeroed. Then the shaft is rotated. The dial indicator should measure any shaft runout that's present. To determine if the runout is excessive, you'll need to refer to your company's policies and procedures or to the pump manufacturer's specifications. Next, sleeve runout is checked. Basically, this is done by installing the shaft sleeve in the impeller, which holds the sleeve in place, then repeating the process that's used for measuring shaft runout with a dial indicator. Checking sleeve runout is important because the seal's rotating element is mounted on the sleeve. Excessive sleeve runout could prevent the rotating element from being properly positioned next to the mating ring. Once the sleeve runout check is complete, the impeller and the sleeve are removed from the shaft again so that other checks can be made. One way to check thrust bearing wear is to mount a dial indicator so that the indicator stem is touching the end of the shaft. Then, after the dial indicator is set to zero, the shaft is moved back and forth, and dial indicator readings are taken to measure the total axial movement. Excessive axial shaft movement could indicate worn thrust bearings. Another important check using a dial indicator is checking the machined surface of the pump frame to see if it's perpendicular to the shaft. The pump back plate, which also forms the stuffing box where the mechanical seal components will fit, mounts directly to this frame, so the frame must be perpendicular to the shaft to prevent misalignment and seal damage. The frame is checked by mounting a dial indicator on the shaft so that the stem touches the machined surface of the frame. The dial indicator is zeroed, 
and a mark is made at the starting position. Then the shaft is rotated. Four readings are taken at 90 degrees apart. If the frame and the shaft are perpendicular, the four readings should be the same. It's important to remember that any pump repairs that are necessary must be made before the mechanical seal is installed. Adjustments that are made after the seal is mounted could easily alter the position of the rotating element and cause the seal to fail. Now try answering some questions about checking pump components before installing a mechanical seal. In this topic, we've demonstrated a typical pump disassembly to remove a mechanical seal, and we've described various pump component checks that must be made to prepare for the installation of a new seal. To test your understanding of what we've covered, try answering some practice questions. Once a pump has been disassembled, the old mechanical seal has been removed, and the standard pump component checks have been made, installation measurements must be taken before a new mechanical seal is installed. Some of the pump components are reassembled temporarily so that these measurements can be taken. The measurements are used later to position the components of the new mechanical seal. Impeller clearance is usually one of the first measurements that should be taken. In our example, the rotating element of the mechanical seal mounts on a shaft sleeve. To begin reassembling components so that the measurement can be taken, the sleeve must be positioned onto the shaft. Care is taken to make sure that the sleeve is properly engaged on the drive pins or keys. An improperly positioned sleeve could be damaged when the impeller is installed. After the sleeve is in place, the pump backplate is positioned onto the frame. The match marks on the backplate and the frame are checked to make sure that the backplate is properly aligned. Once the backplate is in place, the nuts that hold it onto the frame should be tightened evenly. Next, the impeller, which holds the sleeve in place, is installed. Then the clearance between the impeller and the backplate will need to be measured. The clearance between the impeller and the backplate must be measured to make certain that the impeller is positioned correctly. The impeller holds the shaft sleeve in place, so if the impeller is out of position, the shaft sleeve and the mechanical seal components on the sleeve could be out of position as well. And if these components are out of position, the mechanical seal could fail. To determine the proper clearance between the impeller and the backplate, the pump manufacturer's specification should be checked. Then the gap between the impeller and the backplate is measured with a feeler gauge. And this measurement determines if the impeller is positioned properly. After the impeller clearance has been measured, the shaft sleeve is marked so that the rotating element can be positioned properly later. This is done by first applying bluing to the shaft sleeve along the edge of the stuffing box. Then a line is scribed in the bluing to mark the edge of the stuffing box. This line is a reference line for positioning the seal's rotating element. Once the line is marked, the pump components are disassembled again. First the impeller is taken off. Then the nuts that hold the back plate in place are removed and the back plate is taken off of the pump frame. Finally, the sleeve is removed from the shaft. And additional bluing is applied, this time along the length of the sleeve. Next, the seal manufacturer's installation instructions are checked to determine where the collar should be mounted on the shaft sleeve. The position of the collar is determined by using a measurement that's often called the location dimension. The location dimension is used to measure along the sleeve from the line marking the edge of the stuffing box. 